Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. And may they be in keeping with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, born this night and in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I arrived home from the church around dinner time one evening, and I was stopped dead in my tracks as I walked into my living room. My fluffy orange cat, Monroe, was staring intently at a small furry creature on the floor. It took my mind a moment to process and register the presence of this uninvited guest, a small mouse. Uh, that sat in perfect contentment, perfectly still, save for a slight twitching of its nose. It wasn't something the cat dragged in. The cats don't go outside. I don't know where it came from. And in fact, after uh, sniffing in its general direction for a couple of minutes, Monroe lost interest altogether and, uh, you know, went to go sit on a plastic bag or whatever cats do for fun these days. Well, I didn't know what to do next. You know, I, uh, I didn't want to alert my, my wife, who was upstairs, and, you know, gets a little nervous around rodents, particularly when they're in her house. Um, so, you know, I knelt down for a closer look, and the mouse was really small, you know, couldn't have been more than three or four inches long probably less than a week old, I would guess, because I'm an expert on baby mice. <laughs> but, you know, I did do a little online research on my phone in the moment, and uh, uh, I saw that its, uh, its eyes were still closed, you know, and that that was an indication of infancy. So this thing was very little, very young. It wasn't crawling around, just kind of you know, stretching its paws uh, occasionally, Uh, a helpless little babe in the wilderness of my home. The rest of the family was still upstairs, uh, so before letting them know what was going on, I I decided to call animal control. Um, (laughs) They did not answer the phone, so I got to work quickly. I found a small shoebox, and I I padded it with paper towels, and I, I picked the tiny creature up as gently as I could, uh, feeling the contours of its ribs beneath my fingers. I just gently picked it up and placed it in the box. Now, I have to tell you, I've not had a lot of luck caring for creatures such as these. When I was in graduate school, my roommate had a hamster named Plop. Now, Plop had a glass enclosure Uh, that rested atop a tall dresser in my roommate's bedroom. And one weekend, uh, my roommate and his girlfriend decided they were going to go take a trip to Colorado uh, and asked me to watch the hamster for him, leaving behind a detailed list of instructions for its care. And I, you know, I wished them well, and I closed the front door, and I I brought the list of instructions up the stairs to, to leave it next to the hamster enclosure, But by the time I arrived, Plop was gone. He had been in my care for less than 90 seconds, and I'd lost him. He completely vanished. I called out his name, Plop, Plop, where are you? Even in that moment, I knew how stupid I sounded. (laughs) Oh, Plop, I moaned. Why did it have to end like this? And with my back against the wall, I slid down to the floor in despair. And then looking to my side, I saw him. Turns out that Plop was scurrying behind that tall dresser from which he had apparently leapt in a sentimental attempt to follow his master to Colorado Springs. No. All's well that ended well. He bit me when I tried to to get him back in the cage. But, you know, he was fine. Plop 
was just fine. Even so, I, I thought about all this as I was, you know, putting this hamster, uh, I'm sorry, this mouse, you know, in the box. And I just, I thought, I don't know, I, do I have what it takes to take care of this thing? Um, but I mixed up a little bit of my son's baby formula. Uh, and I, you know, I poured just a tiny little bit of it into a plastic uh, nipple that goes with the bottle. And uh, you know, I gently picked up the little mouse and held it up to his tiny little lips, trying to squeeze out the smallest possible drop. After I alerted my family to the situation, you know, once it was all under control, uh, we debated what to do with the mouse. Willowbrook Wildlife Center uh, seemed like the best chance for its survival, but they were closed for the night. And Monroe, the cat, uh, had already taken a renewed interest and was lurking around the shoebox. So in the end, I tucked the baby mouse in as best as I could, and I left the shoebox in our garage for the night where the cats couldn't eat it, and I prayed that it would survive the early spring chill until dawn. The youngest creatures among us compel us to treat them gently. It's instinctual, really. You know, we see a baby whether it's a kitten or a human infant, and we know that they have to be handled with care. When my first son was born, I held him with kid gloves. I was afraid that the slightest bump or scratch would scar him. I can specifically remember the day he was born, putting him back down in one of those little plastic cribs they have at the hospital, and I, you know, I just bumped his head ever so slightly on the edge, and I, I broke out in a cold sweat, terrified that I'd broken him like he were some antique china doll. But you know, after a few years of falls and scrapes and bruises, you start to relax a little. As a child gets older, their body can generally tolerate more pain and injury. They start running around carelessly, smashing into things, no longer a china doll, but rather a bull in a china shop. I wish I could say that we outgrow this kind of recklessness. But you know, truth be told, uh, as an adult, when I'm not handling a, an infant or a baby mouse, I can be a little careless. I'm not always so gentle. In fact, I am downright clumsy and perhaps a bit oafish. After putting my oldest son to bed one night last month, I uh, began racing down the stairs, uh, glad for a little bit of me time. I was going to go, you know, watch a movie or something. And I slipped backwards, and I, I fell on my back, and I, I fell down a few stairs. And uh, I looked at my pinky finger, and it was bent at a 90-degree angle, like a sign post pointing to something towards my left. Now, some might have panicked, but in my eternal optimism, I just tried to, you know, wrench it back into place <laughs> with my good hand. And, uh, you know, I did that, and then it just sort of fell loose again. Uh, so I tried a second time. You know, this time I managed to get the bone back into the socket, uh, but not before I'd done some significant damage to the tendon. Kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> Maybe it was a foolhardy thing to do. But isn't that how we live when we're at our worst? Racing through life, breaking things, inflicting pain, trying to solve problems with sheer force instead of a gentle touch. Could be that by arriving on this earth as a helpless infant, God is trying to tell us something about being gentle and kind. If the creator of all things, bringer of wind and rain, who dwells in a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night, needs to be handled with care, what does that say about how we handle each other? 
While out and about in the world, I see a great deal of unnecessary roughness. I hear people honking their car horns at each other, sighing loudly and dramatically while standing in line to buy Christmas presents at the mall, even shouting at one another at the employees of some store. You know, a friend of mine was, um, was in the produce aisle uh, at the grocery store, and a woman came up to him and demanded, why aren't there any more bananas? Aren't you going to bring out some more bananas? And when my friend informed her that he didn't work there, <laughs> she replied, oh, I guess that's good, nervously laughing, because I was about to say some really mean things to you. Why do you have to say mean things? But this sort of thing pales, of course, to the real evil that's perpetrated in the world. Not just the obviously violent stuff, like the war and the murder, which is bad enough, but the systemic evil and injustice that marginalizes the poor, the refugee, the ones without a voice in the halls of power. They're treated roughly. And all of these descriptions of... uh, All these descriptions fit Joseph, Mary, and Jesus to a T. Every day, all over the world, people are told that there is no room at the inn. Would we treat a baby this way? And this is the problem, isn't it? Because we treat grown-ups, other grown-ups, other people, as though they can handle it, you know, because they're not a little baby. We saw how people treated Jesus when he grew up. But it's not how God treats us. Yeah, I know there's a lot of stuff in the Bible about God smiting and judging and punishing and generally handling creation like a kid smashing a toy car into a wall over and over again. But those scriptures were written in different times, violent times. When a God who couldn't smite somebody wasn't worth a prayer. That's how people understood the world, the universe back then. That's how people understood God. It's not how we understand God now. That's not who God really was or is. Our understanding has changed I believe that God handles us gently. Rather than emerging in a thunderstorm or manifesting in a tornado or rising from the shattered earth like some eldritch force, God appears in a lowly manger. Jesus is not a slap in the face, but rather a gentle caress of the cheek. Yes, he spoke hard truths. Yes, he boldly called out injustice and those who would perpetrate it. But in speaking to us as another human being, God is like the parent who gets down on one knee, holds the screaming toddler close, and whispers calmly in her ear. Christmas, especially Christmas Eve, is a gentle and tender time. Forgiveness and generosity and mercy seem to come more easily. It's like when we look at the Christ child, it seems easier to follow the teachings of the man that he would become. But the lesson of Christmas, the lesson of Christianity, the lesson of Jesus is that we should always handle creation and the creatures who dwell within it with care. I breathed a sigh of relief the next morning when I went into the garage and found that the mouse was still alive, seemingly no worse for wear. Now, maybe I'm a hypocrite because I'm not a vegetarian, but I do have a soft spot for small furry animals. I have a confession to make. I, uh, 
I found a mouse in the church once, many years ago. It was, uh, it was in the kitchen sink. And it was, you know, trying to scrabble its way up the stainless steel walls, a, a hopeless effort. It was totally trapped. So, you know, I found a, a pair of rubber dishwashing gloves and I put one on and, uh, you know, I reached into the sink and picked up the mouse. I stared into its beady little eyes for a moment and I uh, wasn't sure what to do. So, you know, in the end, I just put it down on the counter and let it run away. <laughs> I know. I know. Probably not the smartest thing to do, but it was cold outside. And besides, you know what we're all about here. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And anyway, like I said, that was a long time ago. You know, it was like, I haven't seen that mouse in like 10 years. Trust me. There are no mice in this church, okay? Anyway, relieved to find the mouse in my garage still alive, I brought the shoebox to the Wilbrook Wildlife Center, and they looked the little guy over. They reported that he was uh, a little bit dehydrated and stressed out, but otherwise in good health. I don't know how they could tell that it was stressed out. If they had to talk to a therapist, which I don't know. But anyway, they said they would handle it with care until it was a little older, and then they would release it into the forest preserve. We, too, are held by hands larger than ourselves. We are nourished and nurtured, and then return to the wider world strong enough to survive. God handles us gently. And this Christmas and in the weeks and months beyond, my prayer is that we would handle one another gently and care for each other as we would the Christ child in the manger. Merry Christmas. Amen.